So let's talk about Extro, one of my favourite horror movies. It was directed by Harry Bromley Davenport. I don't actually know much about him, to be honest. I know he directed two sequels and he's got a third on the way. It looks awful. He's a British director and he seems like a guy who's passionate about making movies. He seems like a guy who cares about the craft. It was produced by Robert Shea, or executive producer, I should say. Robert Shea founded New Line Cinema. He's a fairly big name in the industry, and he's essentially responsible for producing the, the Nightmare on Elm Street films. He also produced the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The original script was written by Harry Davenport and a guy called Michelle Perry. It took a lot of influence from Hammer horror movies, classic horror movies like Frankenstein and things like that. When they read this script, they kind of realised this isn't modern, this isn't new. So a rewrite was commissioned from Ian Cassie and Robert Smith who brought a more modern approach. They brought a lot of stylings in from, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Phantasm, those kind of shocking modern horror movies. And a lot of this was down to Robert Shea, the executive producer as well, who basically wanted a modern, shocking, sort of punchy approach that people would remember more than, you know, a classical horror movie that was dated. Extra is essentially a divorce drama disguised as a pulpy horror movie about aliens. It's about a family, mother, husband, mother, husband. <laughs> it's about a family, mother, father, and child. Um, the couple are Sam and Rachel, and their child is Tony. And at the start of the movie, we see Sam being abducted by aliens. Tony is the only one who witnesses this, Rachel's away. And three years later, Tony sticks by his story. Rachel's moved on and got a new fella called Joe. And she doesn't believe Tony, she just thinks that Sam ran away. So Sam returns to Earth, he's been basically deposited back on his homeworld by the aliens, and he's come back to collect his son Tony and potentially his wife Rachel. So it's a divorce drama from the perspective of a family that's broken apart because of the disappearance of the father. He comes back and it's basically about the situation between these four people. The woman split between two men, her ex and her new fellow who she's going to get engaged, well, she's engaged to be engaged, I guess, and their son, Tony. That's the heart of the movie, is this divorce drama, but it's obviously got this um, layer, this veneer of being, which it is, it's, a, it's a, a horror movie about aliens, but it's got this veneer of being that, because the real story is the divorce drama. It's this family going through this terrible thing, um, and beginning to reconnect but not quite doing so because the father's changed, he's now an alien. The leading actors playing Sam and Rachel are Philip Sayer and Bernie Stegers. They are... they're from a lot of stage and TV stuff, they're, they're kind of classically influenced actors, and their performances in the movie are very theatrical. They're not very movie-like, and I think that kind of works in a movie like this. It's got a ridiculous premise, and so having these great actors um, who bring a sort of grandiosity and a sort of... they sort of elevate the film from being this silly horror movie with a silly alien abduction premise to being, like, high drama. There's also some amazing guest characters in the movie, I say amazing. Mariam Darbo makes all three of her debut appearances in this movie. Um, obviously she went on to become a Bond girl, but she started off in this movie and she's like a living maid called Annalise who, who sort of helps Rachel and Joe with Tony. Um, there's also a lot of colourful characters around the building where they all live. There's this woman who lives downstairs who's just incredibly miserable and horrible. There's also, um, I guess, like a caretaker for the building who just <laughs> hates everyone. Um, and he's quite fun. Robert Pereno is in the movie. He's not a big actor. But he's in the movie, he gets killed by the alien, they crash into it in their car, him and his girlfriend, he gets out of the car and he goes, STAY IN THE CAR! GET BACK IN THE CAR! I think a big issue with this movie for me, and it is a favourite of mine, but an issue that I have to recognise and kind of acknowledge, is that there are some dubious sort of things in the script um, regarding logic and kind of the logistics of a situation. So a woman gets her foot trapped in a fucking steering wheel and manages to get eaten by an alien, well killed by an alien. There's also a car park which is like wide open and a guy manages to crash into a car that's there. He's going at like five miles an hour, crashes into the back of the car, 
and the whole reason for that is so they all get out of the car, look in the passenger seat and see a woman with her guts hanging out. It's just bad logic. I think the real strength of this movie though is the filmmaking more than the script. The you know, precise details of the script aren't the best. It's more sort of the logic of a movie to get people from A to B and to get these these scenes happening and these horrific things. But the filmmaking itself sort of disguises that and, and the fact is it's an amazingly made film. So you can kind of excuse the inconsistencies and the weird little details in the script. This movie is immensely creative. It's got this surreal imagery, the kind of imagery you'd see in a, a Lucio Fulci movie or like Suspiria or something. Um, or the colours of a giallo like Suspiria. It has images of, you know, there's a phone melting in a phone booth. There's toys coming to life, moving on their own. There's this creative, what, sort of colourful imagery and, and colours washing out certain scenes. Tony's bedroom is the centre of all this. And there's a lot of crazy imagery and, and sort of surrealism in that room that's focused on him and his toys coming to life. There's also a lot of sexual imagery in the movie. Sex is a big part of the movie. <coughs> Sorry. Um, a lot of that is thanks to Marion Darbo, and I guess there was some producer pressure to um, get her naked in certain scenes, which is a bit odd. Um, but there is a lot of sexual imagery to what's happening, and I think the movie's best not when it's showing actual sex, because that always puts me off in movies, I just find it weird. But when it's actually showing imagery or suggestive sort of material that implies a sexual connection or like a sexual sort of layer to what's going on. When Sam comes back to Earth, he has to impregnate a woman through her mouth and then she becomes this giant pregnant thing, like a vessel for him, and she gives birth to him, a full-grown, you know, like a dude just crawling out of her. That's the kind of imagery that I'm talking about and that's what sticks with me. There's also a very uncomfortable scene in which Sam finds his son Tony with kind of his shirt hanging off and he gives him, he transfers his alien powers into Tony. Um, but he does so by sucking on his shoulder and injecting eggs into his shoulder. It's very weird and very uh, difficult to watch and kind of creepy, but it again, it's that creepy vibe and that sort of dedication to making the viewers squirm and and challenging what can be gotten away with in a horror movie, I suppose. Annalise, in the end, gets turned into an egg machine hanging from the wall, and she's basically got this funnel through which she dispenses eggs for one of Tony's little toy clowns to collect and put in a fridge. It's great stuff. It's really creative imagery, and it's not exploitative or weird. The most exploitative stuff in the film is really the actual sex, which isn't really that bad, but do you know what I mean? It's That's what feels exploitative, not so much the creative imagery that's going on. There's also some wonderful creatures in the movie. The special effects were supervised by a guy called Tom Harris, who's worked on a few bigger films. He actually worked on Star Wars Episode Two in some capacity. The creatures are creative and they're really interesting. The initial creature is essentially a guy crawling on his back, a contortionist crawling on his back, but it looks like a creature whose bones are fitted the wrong way around and it, it's really memorable. There's also the final forms of Tony and Sam when they leave the Earth in the end, which look horrifying. Movies are visual, I think it's important to remember that. And that's something that filmmakers seem to forget, is that movies are visual. You're not just filming it with a camera so people can see it. You're filming it with a camera because it's the imagery, it's the visual element that a book or something like that is missing. You need that visual element to tell the story, and that's what Harry Davenport uses so well, is these creative visuals, these colourful sets, these amazing creatures. And these are all the weapons that he uses. He weaponizes these things and creates a really effective movie using that. The things that stand out to me the most are the performance by Philip Sayer, the leading man. He is excellent in this movie. He shifts seamlessly between basically um, a man in a broken family dynamic who is being challenged by this new guy, Joe, and who really wants to look after his son and, you know, be with his wife again. Seamlessly between that and an alien who's come to Earth to abduct his family. Um, it's an amazing shift in performance and the way he acts around the adults versus the way he acts around his kid, Tony. It's a great contrast and it's a really interesting performance that Philip Sayer gave. 
The movie seemed to perform well with audiences. People liked it at the time, and that's general audiences. Critics did not like it. Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel were very critical of this movie. Our first movie is one of the most mean-spirited and ugly thrillers I've seen in a long time. It's called Extra, and it's a monster movie, and it's not a very good monster movie, but that's okay because most monster movies aren't very good. And a number of other critics were too. They called it, um, you know, immoral and cynical and depressing and miserable, and it's a horror movie. I think horror movies can be too miserable and can be too cynical, and they can feel uh, gratuitous or exploitative for the sake of being horrifying. And I don't like horror movies like that, but Extra never does feel like that. Everything that happens that's miserable or depressing is in the service of a really interesting story. And it's being treated seriously. It's not being treated as exploitation material. It's being treated as a serious movie, and that's really what elevates the movie and holds it together, I think. Some people even compared the movie to E.T. It's true that it has a similar premise, except it's the inverse. Instead of a family being brought together by an alien, it's a family being torn apart by one. The only similarity, really, apart from that, which is kind of circumstantial and just coincidental, is that it did channel E.T. with its marketing, not channel the spirit of E.T., but channel the success of E.T. There were posters that played off the success of E.T., and that's not a bad thing. Movies do this all the time. To treat it like it's an E.T. knockoff or some kind of jab at E.T., which it definitely wasn't. It wasn't written as a jab at E.T., it was written as, essentially, and it's the same reason The Thing failed. It's a horror movie that involves aliens, and people are so overjoyed with this holy grail that is E.T. that they can't accept a movie that demonises or weaponises the fact that aliens are scary, we don't know what they are and what they're capable of. And it's a horror movie that uses aliens to great effect. The Thing is a, probably a better movie than Extra overall, but it's a similar premise, a movie about aliens, and it also failed critically. I think Roger Ebert hated The Thing as well. I could be wrong about that. These movies are not made to jab at the success of other movies, unless there's a direct reference to E.T. in the film, which there isn't. Then why are people upset, or why were they? I don't think it's justified. I think it's writing the movie off with these, like, lame, imagined reasons. And basically saying, you didn't like the movie, so I'm going to start acting like it's jabbing at E.T. I don't think that's true at all. I think it's actually a really original movie, and it's a movie that deserves to be judged on its own merits or its own failures, not compared to a movie that was made for a much higher budget and with a much different target audience in mind. I would absolutely recommend this movie to anyone who likes... I guess anyone who likes B-movies. I think if people like B-movies, they're probably more geared towards, you know... They're probably more aware of the limitations of those kind of movies with those kinds of budgets. With Extra, there is a certain limitation, sure. But there's also a lot of creativity to be found and a lot of imaginative elements that I think a, a typical B-movie wouldn't have. This elevates above a lot of typical B-movies and it really sort of elevates into just great filmmaking territory. And for that reason, I'd also recommend it to people who love filmmaking as a craft and love seeing how a director and his or her team can bring a movie to life with such a limited budget and yet still have a really successful um end product. Because there are loads of memorable things in this movie. There's the standoff between Sam and Joe. When Tony's calling for his dad, they both stand up. Joe sits down. Sounds like, yeah. That's right. There's also the colour scheming of certain scenes. As I said, it's very Jalo, it's very Suspiria, or... You know, it's it's very, like, solid colours. There's a red room for no reason. And it doesn't matter, it, it doesn't make sense in the context of the story, but in the context of the film it makes perfect sense. All these things are just elements that stick with me and are really memorable, and it makes the movie stand out than a bunch of other movies would. Um, and with a different director and a different creative team, I think this movie could have been really generic, really boring, and just not memorable. It would have been forgotten, and the fact is it hasn't been. I think the best praise I can give Extra is that it's not perfect. But it feels perfect. It might as well be, because it, it its imperfections fall to one side and all the perfections just stand out. It's perfect despite its imperfections. It's greater than the sum of its parts.